डॉक्टर सोनलाल जैन पार्टिसिपेंट्स ऑफ दिस वेबिनार ऑन ई कोर्स ऑन एटमोस्फियर आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस इवेंट ऑफ स्पेस एजुकेशन एंड रिसर्च फाउंडेशन एज यू ऑल नो दैट दिस इज लाइक ए कोर्स so at the end of the talk there will be a questionnaire uh, which will be of mcq type and uh, you you can fill those questions and submit uh, if in case you are not able to fill at that time or you want to fill it later these questions for all the four talks will remain available on our uh, blog as crf amdavad blog as well as on the facebook so you can go there and uh, uh, click on the appropriate uh, question paper fill it and submit you are given only chance one time and uh, so uh, that is what it is before i hand over the mic to uh, dr sonlal jain i would like to uh, briefly uh, introduce him and his work uh, to you dr sonlal jain uh, was born in a village islamabad in rajasthan on june 7 in 1946 uh, he had a very uh, brilliant academic career and uh, got his uh, bsc msc and phd degree in 1967 69 and 1974 respectively at udaipur university Uh, while just come about to complete his phd he was offered a position of assistant professor at udaipur uh, university where he taught for a, a period of about little more than a year and uh, then he was offered a scientist position in national physical laboratory uh, at new delhi and he joined that in 1975 and there he did a extremely uh, good work on atmospheric research and uh, uh, it is not exaggeration to say that he is considered as a authority on on lidar he developed differential absorption lidar he developed micro pulse lidar he developed heterodyne lidar and these lidars he <coughs> established at uh, national physical laboratory as well as in the antarctic station of government india which is metri <clears throat> he also indigenously developed several other instruments for <clears throat> the measurement of minor constituents of the atmosphere in 2006 he retired as a head of uh, radio and atmospheric science division uh, and uh, after his retirement for 5 years from 2006 to 2011 Uh, he was a emeritus scientist at the national physical laboratory at new delhi and since then he also has been uh, giving series of lectures uh, on atmosphere at various institutes including at physical research laboratory uh, to the uh, un course uh, he was in his early days uh, in at nasa jet propulsion laboratory uh, for doing Uh, atmospheric research in uh, 1979 to 1981 and uh, he had been to antarctic three times in three different teams the 13th team 16th team and the 21st team uh, for expedition in antarctic and for 21st team he was also the team leader uh, he uh, has been principal investigator for several international and national uh, projects like uh, like ifcar nc and core and apen he has published very good scientific papers uh, 70 uh, scientific papers and presented more than 250 uh, papers in national and international conferences he guided four scholars for their phd work and uh, in india 
there is a, a turning point a very good program uh, for science education on tv he participated in seven of those programs he also has authored chapters in eight books on atmospheric science with these few words i now invite dr sonlal jain to uh, give his presentation dr sonlal jain please good morning all of you uh, at the outset let me thank dr was for giving me the opportunity to interact with with you people internationally sitting remotely and talking to you i hope this will be a good interaction between you and me and maybe the talks will be interesting one i will be talking today on atmospheric structure and composition uh, this will be the second part where we continue the measurements then uh, i will go to the atmospheric structure and i will toss, uh, touch on the atmospheric composition some measurements using lidars at npl uh, then i will talk about atmospheric structure and vertical thermal structure that is troposphere stratosphere mesosphere thermosphere exosphere functional layers and homosphere and heterosphere then scale height and geopotential height and some equilibrium equations and like then we conclude with the talk as you know that particular matters and aerosols are very small particles of solids and or liquids suspended in the air such as dust dirt soot smoke and tiny particles of pollutants major natural sources of these are the volcanoes fires wind blown soil and dust and sand and sea salt or pollens while the human sources of this are the factories power plants fresh incinerator trash incinerators motor vehicles and construction activity but particulate diffuse sunlight and reflect sunlight back it out to the space reducing the amount of intensity of solar radiation reaching to the earth surface and which have a cooling effect for example the eruption of mount pinatomo in 1991 the global average temperature around around 0.5 degree centigrade it was reduced particles serve as a condensation nuclei for water without particulates little water would condense to form the clouds and precipitation which is a very serious problem however particulates such as black carbon can absorb the long wave radiation and they uh, can cause the global warming also and the sum of the uh, the particulates come from one third of them come from the soots from the south asia one third from the biomass burning and rest from the europe and america and all like that so in view of the keeping the importance of the particulate matters we try to establish a micro pulse lidar at a national physical laboratory to measure the vertical profiles of the aerosols that is extinction coefficient and the system has the, this is a commercial system uh, the way at the using the diode pumped uh, solid state ndr laser with wavelength of 532 nanometer and pulse energy 10 microjoules and the very high repetition rate of the 10, 2.5 kilohertz and pulse with 10 nanoseconds and uh, tele the receiver has the telescope and other necessary 20 cm telescope and other necessary electronics this is the block diagram of the system so you have a laser beam and uh, to make a coax coaxial the common Uh, receiving and transmitting system coaxial one you have the send the atmos the laser beam in the atmosphere and back scatter radiations are reaching to the telescope and with the optics and it is then sent to a uh, polarizing beam splitter where the beam is split into the copolarization and the 
parallel cross polarization and then with two different the multiplier tubes you uh, get the signal and record it on the computer this is the uh, front view of the lidar system this is the rear view and this is the p and s channels here and this is telescope and other electronics and optics here this is the whole body of the system it's a quite bulky near about six feet by uh, three feet and uh, depth maybe another two feet so say typical example is that the uh, uh, extinction coefficient this uh, aerosol profile obtained on say uh, 8, 20th august 2007 is on here you can see at 6.5 kilometer a layer of cloud here and which is very thick at initial stages and slowly it was coming thin and thin and then finally disappearing and at the lower altitudes a very high concentration and as you go up less and less con concentration so from this the extinction coefficient was calculated using a software and this is the way we get the uh, extinction coefficient and the here the cloud very prominently shown here this is the this shows the depolarization ratio which tells you whether the particles are solids or liquids so depending on the uh, say if these they are liquid particles or spherical one the depolarization will be almost zero or if they are non spherical then there will be value say up, up to say 0.6 uh, percent or something like that so say at very low levels it's almost spherical one and as you go up they are non say they are the uh, non spherical particles these are the other examples of the extinction coefficient p and s both are shown here then we developed our own micro pulse lidar at npl uh, with a more accuracy and this again use the dendyard laser laser at 4, 532 nanometer and the pulse energy is 4 microjoules and pulse duration 900 picoseconds and repetition rate 7.4 kilohertz so the average power becomes very high because it's a very high repetition rate 7.5 kilohertz then the earlier one 2.5 kilohertz and we again use the uh, Cassegrain in uh, say telescope of 20 centimeter and other optics and this is the signal processing details are given here and we can resolve up to 0.75 in 75 meter 75 centimeter to up to 48 meter resolution we can get and we have again in a software provision to go up to 1.5 kilometer to 12 kilometer and we can select whatever range we want this is the block diagram of the system developed at npl you can see that this is a very how simple uh, say simplified system is there we took a wooden box here and all optics are sitting here on a bench and uh, uh, this uh, uh, the uh, detector is sitting here and telescope is sitting on the wooden box and laser is sitting somewhere over the this one to get the coaxial measurements this is a typical profile we got from using the local indigenously made uh, micro pulse lidar this is the again this you can see some clouds here around 2.2 2.5 kilometer 2.4 kilometer above the ground level and you can see that at lower level the intensity of the particles very high as you go up it's lower and lower backscatter radiation that is the and here in this slide you can see the clouds very well here single cloud, layer clouds here multiple layer clouds are available here and you can see in between you see these lines which are uh, due to the uh, inosonding sondo uh, um, uh, is being run nearby our lidar system so you get the very high frequency uh, whenever it fires and so you get these lines here so they have nothing to do with the lidar system but that are the noise level here 
and again here is the how the aerosols are there in the atmosphere you can see this is again the uh, say uh, with the increased uh, this thing then what we did is we modified this system to in, instead of using uh, say um, uh, two detectors instead of one uh, to use only one detector instead of one uh, sorry use only one detector instead of two uh, to avoid the uh, say errors due to the say gain of the uh, systems and the detector efficiency or other things because two detect detectors you cannot match exactly same and the electronics for them will also be different so what we did is we developed our uh, indigenous system here which is uh, established here and here what we do is we use a uh, stepper motor a computer controlled uh, rotating mirror here so what we do the, the signal coming here passes to the beam splitter that is polarized beam splitter so s polar component is going here and p component is coming here this is a half step motor so what will happen that partly this motor will be vertically here so the signal will be signal uh, will pass through this and the next time it will be blocked here so one time you will get the p component other time you will get the s component and so one detector will be able to see both the signals and then all the electrons electronics and everything is developed here this is the more detailed view of the same uh, system which developed at npl2 use one pmt instead of two and these are the uh, the uh, p and s component uh, obtained from this indigenous micropulse leader see here you get a very uh, thick cloud here at the height of say 4.5 to 5 km height and slowly this cloud down and down and down and somewhere here uh, it's uh, started to rain so there is a optical height where it start to rain and before that you can get the aerosols very high level maybe dust particle and all these things here and as you go up less and less and here maybe they are less polarized one this is the same thing which is showing the depolarization ratio by using the same system and here again you can see the clouds and the so here maybe a dust storm might be there so you have very high polarization ratio maybe dust particles and as you go up it's less and less and this now coming to the atmospheric structure in general air pressure and density decrease in the atmosphere as we go up in the atmosphere however temperature has a very complicated profile with altitude but in general pattern of temperature profile is constant recognizable and useful in distinguishing the atmospheric layers the vertical structure of the atmosphere in different places varies in height being lowest at the poles and highest in the equator the varying height is due to the spatial variation of heating of the planet's uh, uh, surface that is our surface and so the atmosphere is subdivided on the basis of temperature change instead of height the earth's atmosphere contains several different layers according to temperature change as a primary criteria so this is a typical example say lowest layer is say up to 10 km in the polar regions and which may be up to 17 km in the trop tropical and equator regions and uh, maybe plus minus 1 or 2 km depending on the weather conditions meteorological parameters so the up to this is a troposphere is the lowest one and out upper level upper boundary of the troposphere is known as a tropopause next comes where the Uh, stratosphere where the temperature instead of decreasing in the uh, troposphere it increases in the stratosphere and this that is due to the reason that the there are a lot of 
uh, infrared radio sorry ultraviolet radiations come the sun are come uh, available here and oxygen molecule is divided split into oxygen atoms and these atoms then recombine with the oxygen available oxygen there and they absorb a lot of energy from the solar radiation and that's why the heating takes place and the temperature increases up to stratopause then the, after the stratopause there is a mesosphere here are radiations are available but the molecular density is very very little so there is hardly any absorption so you can get very the temperature is going on decreasing with height and so the, the mesopause or the mesosphere has the minimum temperature on the atmospheric scale then thermosphere again the temperatures goes up and it can go up to 3000 degree this is a similar diagram showing there it was showing earlier one in the pressure and height this one shows in the pressure altitude in kilometer as well altitude in the miles this slide shows the how the pressure changes with height and also density changes with height and temperature changes with height and also speed of the sound as you go up so you can say that the speed of the sound is very much proportional to the temp as temperature increases or decreases so this i already explained that the troposphere and tropopause this at uh, equators it will be 9 up to 9 km and uh, at the equator it will be 17 km and uh, there is a rate of change in the ten temperature with altitude in the troposphere is known as environmental lapse rate of the temperature and it varies from day to day and place to place it may be today something and tomorrow it will be some different so average temperature uh, lapse rate is around 6.5 degree centigrade per kilometer and the uh, it may vary 6 degree to 7 degree depending on the place and day to day temperature and weather conditions this slide shows the how what are the elements available what are the gases or elements available at different uh, layers say in the stratosphere troposphere you have nitrogen oxygen h2o and other gases in the uh, say stratosphere you have nitrogen oxygen ozone and cfc's chlorofluorocarbons and then like this you have different components in different layers under certain conditions or certain with right conditions the air temperature may actually increase with increase in altitude above the earth instead of decrease and when this occurs we are experiencing an inverted lapse lapse rate of the temperature or simply an inversion and this happens during sometimes nighting in the sub sub, sub arctic or polar regions very common this thing and sometimes it happens in the mega cities also what happens due to this that either the temperature rep lapse rate is very slow in uh, uh, comparison to normal mal or it increases with time with height so what happens that they all pollutants are trapped trapped here and so it causes sort of health hazards here and one example i will give is the great smog of 1952 when this happened uh, say four five days continuous inversion was there and near about 11000 to 12000 deaths took place due to the respiratory respiratory problem uh, due to the great smog of 1952 in london then again there is a due to the index of refraction also decreases during the inversion uh, inversion and you can see the mirage effect you can see and you can have this type of thing and also say very high frequency that is 90 megahertz radio waves or maybe very high frequency low band television signals can be seen 
uh, almost few for hundreds of kilometers during the inversion time, which is normally not, you cannot see. Then stratosphere starts from 50 to 55 kilometer and goes up to 50 to 55 kilometer. It varies maybe plus minus few kilometers and temperature increases with height due to increased absorption of ultraviolet radiations by the ozone layer and though the most of the stratosphere the air temperature increase with an increase in elevation creating a temperature inversion and energy penetrates less and less downwards and hence the temperature decreases toward the bottom of the stratosphere then mesosphere you can say 99.9% .9 of the whole gases percent of the gases in the atmosphere is below mesosphere so most of them are uh, below this the 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 extremely thin and air pressure very small there and with very low molecules capable of absorbing solar radiation so there is hardly any uh, absorption so of solar radiation so the temperature goes or decreasing as you go up and the uh, upper level of the uh, mesosphere is known as a mesopause and uh, meteors as you can see here and the temperature goes as low as minus 85 degree to 100 degree minus uh, degree centigrade then thermosphere here the temperature again increases with height and it can go up to 1500 to 2000 degree centigrade although temperature is high but you will not feel the heating of heat there because the molecules or um, molecules or air are so rarefied that individual molecule have to travel maybe kilometers between their uh, collisions so the energy transfer is very little and that's why heat effect is very low although temperatures are very high this uh, international space shuttle station and all these orbit near, near about 320 to 380 kilometer that is in this level and the upper level of the troposphere is known as tropopause then the exosphere is outermost layer of the earth's atmosphere and extends from the exobase to upwards and it is mainly compound of hydrogen and helium and these particles are so far apart that they can travel hundreds of kilometer without colliding without colliding with, with another since the particles are rarely collide the atmosphere no longer behaves like a fluid and these free moving particles follow ballastic trajectory and may migrate into out of the magnet sphere and solar winds. Then we have functional, layer, functional layers and there are two out of them that is one is known as ionosphere and another is the uh, ozonosphere and uh, ionosphere starts near about say uh, 60 kilometer and goes up to 200 to 300 kilometers and that is uh, a large number of uh, radiation say uh, cosmic ray, uh, rays, gamma rays, x rays, short wave, ultraviolet radiations these are being absorbed there and the uh, spectacular display of uh, error lights is generally found in this region and they are further divided into the ionosphere is further divided into D E, E, S, F1 and F2 layers depending on the uh, peak of peaking of the electron density at it, uh, different heights. So lowest one is D region and highest is F2 region. Myself, uh, itself, my PhD was on the absorption of the D region absorption and for that I designed myself or on uh, transmitters, receivers and even oscilloscope and recording system uh, to study the D region absorption and we used to work overnight and days for getting the absorption with the diurnal variation of the 
ionospheric absorption at 2.5 megahertz, 3 megahertz, 3.5, 4 megahertz. So this was we made a tunable transmitter. So we used to study the multi frequency absorption at different frequencies. Uh, the ionosphere is not only really a layer of the atmosphere, but it's the electrified field of ions and free electrons. And earlier, this was only the way of communication purpose during the pre-industrial era. Now, uh, almost all communication is from the uh, satellite uh, satellites, but earlier this was the ionosphere was only the so there was chances sometimes blackouts due to the solar flares or something like that and so you will be not be able to get the signals so blackouts happen to be there then the ozonosphere also called the ozone layer it is concentrated layer of ozone found there in the atmosphere we will talk about the more detail of the, the ozone tomorrow the ozone absorbs the ultraviolet radiations between 100 nanometer to 300 nanometer. The ozone layer absorbs almost 97% to 99% of the sun's ultraviolet radiation that can be harmful to the life on the mother planet Earth. So that is a protecting layer. You can say ozonosphere is a protecting layer or shielding layer or it is an umbrella for the life system on the planet earth so relatively constant through millions of the years seasonal fluctuations of ozone especially over the arctic and antarctic regions are common the ozone layer is thinner at the equator and thicker at the poles ozone concentration is highest in the spring and generally lowest during the autumn time The ozone is a region of concentration of the ozone molecule O3 in the Earth's atmosphere. The layer sits at the altitude of say 10 to 50 kilometer with a maximum concentration means density of ozone per molecule, molecule that is molecules per cubic meter in that stratosphere. the altitude is around 25 kilometers. But if you take the mixing ratio of the ozone uh, at different altitudes, then it will be around 30 to 35 kilometer height. So that should not be confusion between the uh, ozone density and ozone mixing ratio. So ozone mixing ratio is always in the parts per million or parts per billion. So around say 8 to 10 parts per million is the peak value of the uh, ozone mixing ratio around 35 to 40 kilometer height range. And, uh, at the lowest level in the troposphere, it's in the parts per billion, and that is around 40 to 100 uh, ppb, depending on the place, season, and uh, environmental conditions. In recent years, it is seasonally thinning of the ozone layer, primarily at the South Pole, has been observed. This phenomenon is called the ozone hole, and I will discuss about details about the ozone hole in my talk tomorrow. Then you can divide the whole atmosphere in two, total atmosphere in two levels. There are broad levels, broad layers you can say, that is homosphere and heterosphere. The atmosphere may be classified in two parts based on the general homogeneity of chemical com composition is the homosphere and the other one is the heterosphere. In the homosphere, N2, O2, argon, carbon dioxide and other gases dominate and remain constant in their relative proportions. Means say, uh, whatever percentage at the troposphere that will be at the stratospheric heights also. The percentage will be almost similar and this continues up to 100 kilometer and that's why the proportionality remain constant so that's why this layer is known as a homosphere 
or that's all the cases are in the equal um, uh, say decreasing or increasing whatever that is but um, uh, it is almost decreasing but the ratio or the proportionate will remain the same so that is the homosphere of course there is a exception there of ozone layer which is in between there uh, in the homosphere where the, you have the um, peak around 20 5 kilometers or 20 kilometers depending on the latitudes, longitudes. Then there is a heatosphere extends upward from the height of say 80 to 100 kilometers. So, so up to say 80 to 100 kilometers is your homosphere and about that is the heterosphere depending on the latitudes and the heterosphere is the outermost sphere where gases are distributed in dis distinct layers by gravity. Uh, according to their atomic weight. So, depending on the gravity, they, uh, the lighter one will go up and up and the heavier will stay down. So, that is they, they no longer in the same proportion of the percentage, but they will, depending on their molecular weight, they will be more or less at different altitudes. So, extending from an altitude of 80 to 100 kilometers, the lightest elements say hydrogen and helium are found at the outer margins of the atmosphere and the nitrogen and oxygen are found at the um, layers base means uh, lowest part of the uh, heterosphere. This slide shows how this behaves say oxygen, nitrogen or other gas almost uh, constant up to say uh, percentage constant up to say 100 kilometer or 80 kilometer and after that they may some will be decreasing very fast, some may be decreasing where lapse rate is not that fast or maybe exponentially and say like this. So, depending on their molecular weight and uh, this thing after the uh, say 100 kilometer this distribution will, will not be uh, proportionate, but uh, below this. So, this is uh, this layer is known as uh, homo, uh, homo layer and this is the heter heterosphere and homosphere. Now, coming to the atmosphere pressure, atmosphere pressure is nothing but the pressure exerted by weight of the air. Atmospheric pressure is defined as the force per unit area exert against a surface by weight of the air above that surface. In the diagram below, you will see that the pressure at x increases as the weight of the air above is increasing. The same can be said that about decreasing pressure when the pressure at point x decreases if the height of the above air also decreases. Say for example, this way. So, if this thickness increases, so air molecules are more and more if this increases, so the pressure will be more here and if the height decreases, then here the pressure will be uh, less, here it will be less, here it will be less. So, how much air molecules are above that particular place, the pressure will be depending on that. So, atmosphere pressure is nothing but the force per unit area exerting on the point. So, thinking in terms of the air molecules, if the number of air molecules above a surface increases, there are there are more molecules to exert a force on that surface and consequently the pressure increases. The opposite is also true when the reduction in the number of air molecules of our surface will result in a decrease of pressure. So, atmospheric pressure is always measured with the instrument called the barometer. So, barometer is used so that is you will say that the atmospheric pressure is also referred as a barometric pressure. So, if you take a unit area of square inch at sea level, the unit pressure exerting at the ground level will be 14.7 pounds. So, that is the mean pressure applied by the air on the unit area would be 14.7 pounds per square inch or if you take the metric units, that will be 1013.25 millibars of air pressure at the sea level at normal temperature and pressure you can see. 
and the mass of the atmosphere is about 5.15 into 10 raise of 15 tons. So you know the what is the pressure and all this pressure is nothing but the atmosphere pressure, how much pressure is a force per unit area is supplied by the uh, air above that level is known as the pressure. This is the same or uh, typical example for calculating or getting the hydrostatic equation or like this. So say here is pressure P plus delta P and here is P of course this will P will be as it is going or decrease so it will be negative of course but so and say the force per unit area here will be say G P D Z that is the G rho P Z so rho is the density of the air and D Z is the thickness of this layer. So this uh, equation we can get like this for an atmosphere in a hydrostatic equilibrium the balance of forces in the vertical uh, requires that delta P is equal to G that is acceleration due to gravity rho that is density and delta Z is thickness of the layer about the particular point. So you can see mass is equal to nothing but uh, density into volume. So pressure will this force will be mg of course and that is m you can put instead of m the density into volume. So mass will be equal to density into height of the slab into area. So you can say force per unit area will be rho into density into height which is mentioned here. So this is delta p comes like this that this is g rho dz and now if you put this equation like this form that is delta p by if the delta z tend to 0 then delta p by delta z will be g rho and this is nothing but the hydrostatic equation. So I have not gone much in mathematics but maybe a simple uh, things I am giving maybe in two three minutes I will finish this. <coughs> the negative sign here shows that the pressure decreases with increasing height. If we put rho equal to 1 by alpha then the equation can be rearranged to get like this g dz means accelerated due to gravity multiplied by the height is equal to alpha into delta p. And now so you can put this uh, acceleration due to gravity you can put like this that is where well, rho is density a is the area dz is your thickness so it become a volume and the g is the uh, acceleration due to gravity and not that the acceleration due to g is a constant and if z is the geopotential height due to then geopotential height if actual geometric height z is used then g intrinsically will depend on the latitude and height so that's why geopotential height is used instead of just height because height will uh, doesn't take into account the acceleration due to gravity while uh, here in the geometric uh, geopotential uh, heights you take the uh, geometric height uh, and uh, with the g uh, depending on the latitude and longitude. So mathematically you can write delta p is equal to rho g dz which we got last uh, slide here. Here and then you can write p equal to rho rt a standard equation. So uh, putting these values here delta will be equal to minus p upon g r t by d z putting these values in this equation and this will give you a hydrosomeric equation and by putting this the hydrostatic hydrosomeric equation relates to the atmospheric pressure ratio to the equivalent thickness of an atmospheric layer under the assumptions of the constant temperature and tensile gravity and is derived from the hydrostatic equation and ideal case that is hydrostatic uh, equation is like this and to integrate this you can get delta p by p you can put uh, p here and then uh, g r t uh, d z okay so p varies from p1 to p2 and z varies from z z1 to z2 and now here uh, this 
you can integrating this you can get the p2 equal to p1 exponential grt uh, multiply by z2 minus this so this is nothing with the hypersmolic equation then you can have put in the different forms this equation like this and where the h is equal to thickness of the layer uh, z is equal to geopotential height and r is the specific gas constant for dry air and r is given by this value and uh, these parameters are already known this is temperature is in kelvins and g is gravitational constant in meter per second per second square and pressure p is into pascal units so geopotential height is vertical coordinates referred to earth's mean sea level and adjustment to the geomet height that is elevation above mean sea level using the variation of the gravity with the altitude so that gravity uh, variation with altitude is taken into account in the geopotential height so that is the difference between uh, uh, geometric height and geopotential height and now you can put this equation in this form also and uh, that is uh, geopotential height is given by this equation and which normalizes the gravity proportional to uh, g is equal to zero that is the at ground level the standard gravity at mean sea level is the So with this, uh, I acknowledge the material for this presentation was taken from various sources and uh, I sincerely acknowledge the same and express my sincere thanks to all of them for whom I have taken this from whatever sources I have taken the um, material. And uh, thank you very much for the patience hearing and maybe if you have some questions, you can go ahead and we will uh, give answer one by one about the questions thank you i also thank you all also there are a lot of people Pressure depends on temperature. Our Earth has one bar. What? Yes, Lida is also Lida is nothing but light, light and de light detection and ranging. Or uh, there it is uh, radio waves detection and ranging, and I know Sunday is also part of that. Did the depolarization? This uh, Mr. Nisha asked, "What, sir? Can you explain depolarization ratio a little bit?" Again, depolarization ratio is nothing but the uh, uh, say perpendicular uh, polarization component divided by the pa parallel uh, parallel uh, component means parallel polarization components or you can say uh, uh, s polarization uh, say co parallelization by parallel polarization and uh, so the ratio will give you the information about the particular uh, density of particulates uh, shape whether it's a spherical or uh, uh, non spherical if it's a spherical then uh, the value will be almost depolarization ratio will be almost zero and if it's a non spherical the value will vary from say zero onwards uh, say 0 0.6 0 0.7 something like that so depending on the what type of uh, um, particular matters there the depolarization will come and that will give us the information that is liquid particles, solid particles, or different type of particles, say uh, air drops or snow or um, dust or whatever it is. How can the lidar be used to measure wind speed at different heights? Uh, 
this is you use the doppler lidar there and uh, i think the doppler lidar will give you the information about that the propyl ionospheric charged particles are also similar mm -hmm. uh, i can't answer this question from today uh, topic what are the specially important points of atmospheric study and uh, research to make impact on life on that because aerosols also play a very important role because uh, it may have a cooling effect uh, on the global temperature as well as the warming effect and uh, it's a very uh, there have been trying various type of models for uh, particulate matters effect on the climate change but very sophisticated models have still the uncertainty in their results due to the uncertainty of the particular uh, particulates or aerosols uh, effect on the atmosphere because they are place to place varies time to time they varies lifetime is uh, goes from say few hours to maybe months together they can travel from one region to another a continent to other continent so there is large uncertainty in this so it's very important that uh, today's topic about this uh, uh, atmospheric study about the measurement of pollutants is very important then ozone of course is uh, very important because it's uh, acts as a umbrella for us and because other harmful radiations will be coming to the earth and which, which will uh, cause uh, skin cancer and other health hazards and uh, then other uh, say um, other parameters as i have explained about the various uh, constituents with are methane carbon dioxide and uh, say um, chlorofluorocarbons which are the greenhouse gases and the global warming is uh, due to increasing their day to day concentration in the atmosphere and already in the last 100 years the temperature has gone 0.6 degree centigrade and uh, if we don't uh, control our emission levels it may go around more than 2 to 3 degree um, by the end of this century so this is very important to have the regular measurement measurement of this various species in the atmosphere and we have to control our emission levels i mean which points to be focused more for the research study for I will say that the measurements uh, are more important and we have to do more and more international understanding uh, about the um, reducing the emission levels to protect the mother earth. Also I talk that they have a cooling effect as, as the warming effect and there is large uncertainties due to um, in the various models due to their day-to-day uh, -day changes and uh, uh, less information so that's why very important yeah geopotential height i explained already but um, because if you don't take just a um, uh, height actual height from the ground level geometric height and you uh, give the some parameters at certain, uh, certain place but it will depend on the latitude the gravity depends on the latitude and longitude also so therefore uh, it will not give you the proper information about uh, some constituent or some parameters there. So, if you have the geopotential height, it takes into account uh, that uh, what will be the uh, gravity at different latitudes and longitude. So, that will give you the correct information about any parameter. So, that's why geopotential, the geophysical, geophysical physicists and all these geopotential engineers always take the geopotential uh, heights instead of actual height which laser do we use in lidar we normally use various type of uh, lasers in the uh, lidar say i have used myself say carbon dioxide laser for differential episode lidar, lidar uh, and uh, i also use the co2 laser for the laser heterodyne system because this has a multiple uh, frequencies you can tune the laser from 9 to 11 micrometer region region and so you have a large number of absorption lines in that region so you can tune according to your requirement and measure various constituents so the uh, co2 laser also can be used and most of the lidars uh, 
use the uh, for the me scattering and all like that's the nd arc laser so different type of la lasers can be used for different uh, um, what you want to do and depending on that they has uh, the calypso and this used the the um, this uh, semiconductor dark lasers only um, yes water vapor uh, information can be obtained from the lidar information if you have a tunable uh, system there just like laser heterodyne system uh, which we put in the um, uh, at uh, at um, antarctica for measuring the ozone profile which i'll talk tomorrow and give more information about that laser, laser system and uh, also you can use the differential absorption lidar so you tune the laser uh, at one wavelength which is absorbing the water vapor and other wavelength where it doesn't absorb the water vapor so the differential absorption will give you the uh, uh, information of the uh, water vapor in the atmosphere and uh, we did lot of measurements of using the differential absorption radar at ground level um, horizontal measurements using the co2 laser at npn for water vapor and different cases how can we get a powerpoint presentation you gave you can just write to me i will send you uh, thank you for inviting present my question is to mr arvind dewal asks my question is to derive the extinction coefficient which will be appropriate approximate method either uh, fernard or ket yeah it's a approximate method yes right when we will start second lecture means uh, second lectures uh, was today and third lecture will be tomorrow first lecture was yesterday bhutan is then krishna kumar asked the bhutan is gearing up for the value oriented research which has direct help to human kind rather than going exhaustive research but with the less outcome for the human welfare thank you good efforts Uh, calypso data you can get uh, from nasa i think should not be a problem or there are softwares available which you can get or maybe best person to uh, contact is dr uh, uh, the best person is itm pune they are using lot of uh, calypso data for analyzing the the data i have not used the data actually i used my own data so i don't have much information of that but a uh, lot of people are using the uh, calypso data yes it may be difficult but uh, should not be impossible krishna kumar again asked the great to know great to know that atmosphere has great scope and help to society yes thank you is there any drawback of the lidar a uh, drawback of the lidar uh, is that uh, it should be i shape because earlier lidars were using lot of power say milliwatts of the power and that was uh, when you send in the atmosphere it's uh, sometimes it can hit the uh, eyes of the people or birds or whatever is they say in the balloon some going body going or even aircraft and so uh, nowadays we use the micro pulse lidar so its power is very very less but we compensate uh, the, because this uh, return signal will very very less in this case because in millijoule to microjoule you are going uh, 10 uh, 10 1000 times or even more than 10000 times so what you do is um, you uh, compensate this by using high frequency repetition rate Uh, instead of say few hertz say 10 or 50 hertz now use the kilohertz so that is the way lidar is uh, micro pulse lidar you can choose depending on the uh, your how much resolution you want 
if you got very high resolution you take up to 2 to 3 kilometers if you want to get just a vertical profiles you can give go up to 12 kilometer 20 kilometer 30 kilometers so depending on the how much resolution you want uh, and what you want to study upper level or lower layer then uh, it depends the what is the reference light you want please write me at my email so i will try to send this thing because uh, i may not remember the email from here so my email is sohan s o h n 46 at the rate of gmail.com oh that's so good that uh, they say that uh, chintan says that uh, ppt will be uploaded on the blog shortly to please download it from there itself so i think that will be nice So if, uh, so if there are no more questions, I once more thank you, you and uh, uh, have a wish you all the best for your future work. And if there is any need, I uh, help needed, I will be always there to help you. And uh, thank you again for listening patiently and uh, Thank you very much.